Eric Weinstein on Joe Rogan number 1320. Such an incredible conversation between the two and we're gonna unpack the nuance of what was discussed. One of the first things that was talked about was how the real world is a very noisy place to think. And so Eric talked about his preference in living in abstractions and then checking back in to see if the real world is actually governed by those abstractions. Eric talked about if he's in an unstimulating conversation, he'll just play with people. And the, the great danger is complacency, always experiencing change and growth, always playing and experimenting, doing something totally different from time to time. The IDW right now is like the adults in the room as the kids are running riot. And there's been a societal pressure cooker to form something like this, this, this grounded group in nuance, in open heartedness, in truth, in equanimity, and in multivariate analysis on these complex topics rather than the cognitive easing, binary tribalism echo chambers that exist. Then Joe and Eric talked about how there are actually now significant bots that are acting as players on the internet. And we talked about this with Dr. Nicholas Christakis on our show as well, where we talked about his human nature lab and how he was doing things like potentially increasing the amount of cooperation happening online. Well, you can add bots into the online conversation sphere to be positive to increase empathy, to increase cooperation, to increase nuance. Well, there's also bots that can make people more toxic, make people more binary, more cognitive ease, more tribalism, more echo chambers, more hatred. And so we need to be very careful about who we actually engage with in these comment threads and if we even choose to engage in the comment threads sometimes so we can stay focused on our own North Star and our own divine paths of creativity. This is a very interesting field to think about and to be very and have a deep amount of critical thinking about. These bots and algorithms that could potentially be pushing people in certain countries away from their North Star journeys and towards this these pits of distraction and these joker vortexes. So what malevolent forces could potentially be at play in the internet sphere that we're actually not even aware of that we need to do deeper investigations in? And what is the spiritual fragmentation within people in those countries that's causing, and even in our own, that's causing us to want to cast malevolent attacks around the world to distract people from their North Star journey so we can prop up our own economies? Let's be real. We're all on this rock together and that we need to be working together and not distracting each other with these types of malevolences. We need to be, have our own deep spiritual wholeness and help each other with that spiritual wholeness, that divine communion with all that is, with God, with source. And then we won't have the malevolences that we cast into our world as bots that are trying to separate us. Instead, to try and bring us together. We also heard Joe and Eric talk about how it was interesting to have discernment between whether or not it's more conducive towards discourse to have just a two-person, Joe with a guest or Eric with a guest on their programs or ourselves as well with us plus a guest or sometimes when we bring in a second or a third person to the conversation and Eric made it clear that sometimes it's like jazz performances, really good performances, musical artists, or any type of even interlocutors in dialogue, that if done really well, they can actually draw out profound things from the conversation or have a profound musical quartet, for example, or trio. Yet, we've also seen people accidentally step on each other and interrupt when there's maybe really good flow happening. So again, this is a really cool idea. Is who would be a good third pillar to have brought into that, that Eric plus Joe dialogue? Could have there been a good third pillar? Maybe it was just for an hour and a half and then they left or something. So it's always interesting food for thought there. Then also Eric and Joe talked about how men manage intimacy and closeness and how men kind of shit on each other a lot, crack a lot of jokes at each other, which is really fun. And 
also it's important for men to also become vulnerable and to become more intimate with each other and express that love and compassion and deep open-heartedness with each other which in many ways society does not foster that men like to make sure that we're not taking ourselves too seriously when we crack these jokes at each other and whatnot and there's different this is another interesting difference between men and women women have a different methodology in many ways of managing intimacy and closeness and that's very beautiful and we need to appreciate that about each other and see where these things can overlap Maybe some of the joking tendencies of men can help women become more joking. But also maybe some of the closeness and intimate tendencies of women can come and help men as well. Open-heartedness, compassion, love, empathy. All right. In many ways, normal life is unwell. It's both gorgeous, but it's also unwell. It's a very interesting dichotomy. And so... This creative process that basically we look at something and we say that that can, be com that can be totally better. And then we ourselves go through this burden of genius about taking something on our backs to augment something in our world that transcends us for generations to come. And when you're that creative that you're constantly looking at things and you're swimming in ideas and you always want to improve things, some people can look at that and be like, that's a mental health issue. But it's actually not. It's actually one of the most beautiful creative expressions of a human being possible. And we need to start treating it that way as a society. Eric talked about multiple times how he's left the planet. I thought this was very interesting. And that how his new podcast called The Portal actually helps people that are trapped in this ordinary world find a portal which is a call to a journey a call to spend time in a new universe and then when they come back they've returned with this world view augmentation that they can then go and share with other people and inspire those people in a sense this platform nine and three quarters that we can kind of go and venture into and then see the world in a new way and then have this be a call to journey, have it be something that excites us tremendously, and then for us to go and, sh and have a way that we've built a better world and then go and share that with other people. That's a, such a beautiful thing. He gave examples of some of these portals. He said, Antoni Gaudí's La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona is a portal. But that was a very beautiful way of putting it. And that's really true because Gaudí focused on religion, nature and architecture and combining the divine with architecture and nature and I thought that was a really beautiful way of putting it you can see the columns in Sagrada Familia are like massive trees and also Salvador Dali somebody apparently asked him do you take drugs and he said I am drugs maybe maybe that's how that happened that'd be very funny if that is because the persistence of memory and also the dream caused by the flight of a bumblebee around a pomegranate a second before awakening are just gorgeous gorgeous the way they synthesize and artistically express is gorgeous and some people are in psychedelic states all the time and you can kind of see this with some of Alex Gray's artwork as well I think that's a very beautiful thing to have someone that's constantly in those states of divinity, of interconnectedness, of artistically expressing themselves. And those people are actually the most well in such an unwell world. So the ordinary life that it sometimes seems that we live is actually insanely epic. And we need to put this mysticism back in to our lives and also treat it like science and spirituality are can more closely harmonize with each other so there was a really good chunk of time that eric went deep into math and physics and i thought this part was really interesting because we had just had clee irwin on the show for our second round and he's doing very similar work with trying to figure out what's going on with space time and quantum mechanics and the marriage of those two and basically by doing that we can potentially unlock the ultimate nature of our reality at a deeper lens and then that's that in itself is a portal that's a call to journey and when we get deep into that we can potentially unlock a lot of other ways of maximizing our prosperity around the world and it was interesting when they did the breakdown you know from real numbers to complex numbers to quaternions to octonians 
to Serenians. And so I'm trying to understand these a little bit better and better, but really a lot of it is about getting deeper and deeper into the most smallest measurements of existence. And in a sense, when you look at an atom and then you look at the quarks and the electrons, and then when you look at the Planck volume and then you just keep going and what are the what is this pixelation of this fabric of reality that we live in what is that pixelation of it and can it actually be described in mathematical terms and physics terms and then can it even further then be simulated these are very profound questions that are a massive call to journey that we can inspire more young kids to get involved in and there's so many other nuances here. The way that the Cayley Dickinson construction applies to this, the way that the differences between um, the, the Lee groups, the what's the difference between a commutative and a non-commutative or an associative and a non-associative system. These are fascinating things. And there's still so much to be discovered here and we need more people's attention on it. And, this actually also calls to me a lot because really how badly do you want to understand God? How badly do you want to understand source, the ultimate nature of our reality? Because really, if you want to understand it in many ways, it's a beautiful thing to endeavor into the deepest math and physics that exist. And so maybe this is a calling for me and for a calling for many other people is that if we want to understand the ultimate nature of our reality, let's dive deeper into the deepest math and physics out there. They also circled back a little bit into what is a principal bundle, part of foundational framework of gauge theory, and how that relates to the hop vibration, which was talked about on round two with Eric and Joe. So there are just so many edges of knowledge for civilization to focus on that would unlock massive superpowers. And this is a massive invitation for us humans. It's a huge invitation for us to unlock what are the most deepest parts of the nature of our reality. And then for us to be invited in a sense out of the planet and into source code of reality. And I'm really happy that Eric also broke down the C. elegans as well. And it was really cool that Sidney Brenner actually established this as a model organism for the investigation of developmental biology. Because it has its whole genome sequence. It's a thousand cell organism with its whole genome sequence, its whole connectome, which is this neural wiring diagram completed. That's about 300 neurons. And so we can learn a tremendous amount because we are a, a multi tens of trillion organism, cell organism, and it's really difficult for us to be able to understand the full whole genome sequence and wiring diagram of how everything works together here and in our brains. But with the C. elegans, we already did that, a thousand cell organism, a 300 neuron organism. So we can actually see these architectural plans of that organism and we can investigate it more deeply as the simplest place for us to understand complex life. And that this is another portal. The C. elegans is another portal. It's another invitation to dive into the complexity of our world. And for, and for more children around the world and adults around the world to get in, excited about things like this grand unification theory, like the C. elegans, like understanding developmental biology. Another invitation that Eric mentioned was the anomalous magnetic dipole moment, the quantum electrodynamics and quantum field theory, and how we have this incredible analysis that we've done down to 10 significant figures of this contribution of quantum mechanic effects. So can we really do things with objective scientific, empirical trials, hypothesis, understandings versus what seems to be in many ways this subjective social engineering of conversation. And that's another massive thing that Eric mentioned is that if you're coming after my understanding of core reality, this scientific 
but also mystical love for exploring and understanding the world, if you're coming at our lab where we're trying to understand the nature of our reality with these social engineering ways of manipulating the way we understand our reality that we're going to call security and we're going to get you out of our lab and that we don't have to have inclusion for the ideologies that you're trying to bring in. That maybe if you're coming into our lab and you're saying that, well, why is there no one that is a woman or why is there no one that is handicapped or why is there no one that is from Cambodia inside of your lab? Well, maybe I don't need to address that question. Maybe I can just keep hanging out with the people that are at the cutting edge of physics no matter what. I don't care if they're Cambodian or female or if they're handicapped or not. I want the cutting edge people in physics or in blockchain technology or in brain science studies. I want those people no matter what skin color, religion, no matter what they are. Although we also understand there's a principle of inclusion that's important, it's the nuance again where you might have someone from Cambodia or that's a woman or that's handicapped that can bring an interesting realization to the way that we study one of these fields. And just don't you dare bring in some of the social engineering conversations that you're trying to have about our world where you're actually putting at risk our beautiful science journal and the way that we're trying to understand the ultimate nature of our reality. So in a sense, the portal is things like Sagrada Familia, the Octonians, Kaylee Graphs, Principal Bundle, C. Elegans, and then that in comparison to things like gender studies, where you have things that are basically not even empirically reviewed entering into scientific journals. Really, look at those two things. Feel them in your essence. Where does society need to have more of its focus on unlocking the next portals that give us a deeper understanding of the ultimate nature of our reality? So again, as important as inclusion is, exclusion is just as important. Discernment, I don't owe you the time of day. Again, another really good example is maybe there are certain Russians that are just beasts at producing pianists or chess players and that it's not unfair or same thing with in athletics, even though that there can be a significant amount of black people that are successful at basketball or football or other sport, that we're not going to say that that's unfair and that we need to enter in more Latinos or more Asian people into those sports to make it fair. No, you let the meritocracy roll. Is there structural oppression? It's not everything is not structural op oppression, but there may be some because hierarchies can sometimes have tyrannical aspects to them and we need to investigate those more deeply. Again, it's about the nuance. So Eric and Joe talked a lot about this interest in this pipeline of amazing portals that are low hanging fruits and keeping the culture wars out of distracting us from hard progress. It's so important. What are the portals into the lowest hanging fruits that we can, even sometimes the higher hanging fruits that we can then go and adventure into as a journey, as a civilization, and keep the culture wars out of that so we can make effective progress. Eric talked a lot about how he likes doing isolated things in the absence of other people that have a very technical nature to them, which in many ways so many of us have too that we like to be alone, that we like to dive deep into the technical sides of the things that we're studying and synthesize and spend time alone from other people. And in many ways, men are making sacrifices to do things like that a lot. But also women like to be more with other people. They like to socialize more. They like to be with children more and raise children and be with elderly care as well and be with them more. And we need to understand that relationship and maybe there is something we need to do to help fund women's next steps into the STEM fields when they are very interested in them. Because they also have this proclivity to want to raise kids and have family and whatnot as well. Wow, men just are just hardcore focused on their specific thing and just sacrificing everything to do that. So that's a focus on kin work for women much of the time. 
Henner gave the anomaly of women in the 1950s that were successful in STEM. They had husbands that also made a lot of money, so they had a nanny to free them of some of the drudgery so they could focus on STEM. So again, it's about the multivariate analysis. So Eric came on JRE and showcased these most important fields for children and adults to pursue, to enter into portals and push the edge of knowledge. Eric also mentioned how he likes people outside the norms and how sometimes there is an ambiguity to gender or sex, like with intersex people, and how we need to be careful that it could be something that feels like an oppression to people that don't fit into that normal male-female binary, and also the fact that evolution is a constantly ongoing process, and that we can't just dig ourselves into a specific rut of a way that we think. I also really like people that are outside of the norms. I find them way more interesting than people that have had the same experience as everyone else. They talked about how activism doesn't necessarily make for good advancement, that it needs objectivity, and that there are no bad words, there is bad intent, that we can build a skepticism around the ACTs, SATs, and IQ, and how it is in a sense a proxy for intelligence, but that we've met people with low IQs that blow us away. There's creative intelligence, there's emotional intelligence, spatial intelligence, so many other uh, forms of intelligence. So we need to stop the crowding out of the multivariate analysis with the cognitive eased arguments. So where we have binary thinking that's trying to be really loud about complex multivariate issues, we need to just say, get out of our lab, get out of our lab, we're calling security, because we need to focus on the real truth, the multivariate analysis in calculating these things. And Eric and Joe talked about how, in a sense, there are Sometimes like country club Republicans are sympathetic to the far right and meanwhile the left is sympathetic to Antifa and how in a sense they're trying to say that 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 group is not being taken care of and so it is these fringes that are trying to take care of those groups and so I need my organized crime group to get rid of yours and I thought that was a very interesting way of looking at it but we need the middle and we need the middle left and the middle right to work together in this multivariate analysis in the lab, the truth seeking, and then to just keep the fringes in more peaceful circumstances while we do that analysis. We can't keep pushing ordinary human beings to the extremes. We need more middle people to step up courageously. We need to keep the pipeline open for science. Stop choosing activism over civility. You can't build a world on angry activism. We need cross-pollination of ideas between other groups. We need to access the neuronal infrastructure in so many people around the world that could creatively endeavor and build cool things. So meeting the basic needs of humans so that they can creatively endeavor and bring their gifts to the world is so critical. And then ending on how we have to leave this planet, how we started a clock around 1953 with the first hydrogen bomb explosion and figuring out the double helix, this twin nuclei problem. We don't have the wisdom to fuse nuclei or investigate the cell. We are now gods, but for the wisdom. We are now gods, but for the wisdom. And when we interviewed Max Tegmark on our show, he called it the wisdom race and how the democratization of exponential technologies are now becoming more and more ubiquitous and male potentially malevolent while simultaneously our wisdom is not catching up fast enough. We don't realize the divine beauty of us cohabiting this planet together. And that we can't have things like Putin and Trump that are in so many ways not temperamentally fit to have the secrets of theoretical physics. So many of the world leaders are just not temperamentally fit to have these secrets at their fingertips and just to cascade whatever styles of malevolence that they want around the world on other people. So we need to diversify and spread ourselves out. Yes, Earth. Yes, underground. Yes, into space. Yes, into the, onto the moon and Mars. We also need to understand the source code of our reality and that the big questions around particle theory being based on geometry, that the purpose of the portal, Eric's new show in so many ways is to galvanize the world around the next steps in understanding the ultimate nature of our reality. 
We need to take arms against the sea of troubles that we face. And we need to ask these massive questions. Does something unprecedented happen when we finally learn our own source code? That was Eric's last question on the edge. Does something unprecedented happen when we finally learn our own source code? Such a great question. And asking those big questions, the biggest questions ever, what built reality? Who are we? What is the point of this? And what's the source code of this? Ask each other those questions. Ask our families, ask ourselves these questions more often. Ask people online these questions. These big questions are the ones that can more easily bring humanity together. We need to really be careful with the amount of distractions that we have as we focus on these questions. It's going to be entertaining, but we have to focus in our labs around these questions. And we are all scientists. We are all spiritual. We all have to figure out how to focus in on these big questions and on to bringing our gifts into the world and helping others bring their gifts into the world and to figure out how to cohabit this planet together more peacefully, with more love, and with more proclivity towards the big questions of science and spirituality. Who built this? Why we're here? All right. That's it. That's been a nice synthesis on Eric's recent appearance on Joe Rogan number 1320. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I greatly appreciate it. I'm your host of the show Simulation, Alan Sakyan. You can find all of our great interviews with leaders from around the world from different fields, at the edge of their fields on this channel. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them and help them grow. All of our links are below. Support us, help us grow and have more of these conversations with people that we talked about in this episode and that Joe and Eric talked about too. Much love. Thank you so much for tuning in. And also, guys, plant trees. This tree right here, I planted 11 years ago with my mother. And look at how big it is now. It's now providing me with shade. We're going to plant some more trees again. Highly recommend it. It's a very spiritual exercise. And it also connects us to things that transcend us so do that plant a tree guys and watch it grow so long-term delayed gratification it's beautiful thanks everyone for tuning in see you soon peace